as I was saying yesterday during the launch, uh, when you were black in this country during apartheid, you didn't have to choose whether or not you'll be in politics. Politics mm. was our uh, very existence. Yeah, you the worried, way of life. Yes, you yeah. worried every time about whether or not you would be arrested or your mother would be arrested or your father would be arrested or your brother would be arrested. And that kind of upbringing makes you uh, political at a very young age. And mm. I had experiences at a very young age, as I chronicle in my book, yeah. when people that were white and were friends of my mother, and my mother would have tea with them because she was buying clothes from this Mrs. Motsakis, mm. who lived mm. in Bloemfontein at the time. And then just because I asked to use the bathroom, Mrs. Motsakis just turned into some other person that I couldn't recognize because sure. she couldn't fathom how she could lend, make me use her bathroom. Wow. And yet I used to go there every Saturday to pay my mother's bills for the dresses my mother used to buy from her. Mm, mm. And she and my mother, at least I thought they were very close, you know, but, and they would sit and have, you know, tea once in a while if my mother has time to go and fit the dresses herself. And on this one occasion when I wanted to use the bathroom, she told me, my mother, that, oh my goodness, she was shivering. She, you must tell her, take care down there, down there where what? the non-white toilets are. And I must have been about 13, you know, or 12 uh, when, when that happened. Hmm. And because I also went to school in Lesotho, you know, my parents used to want us to escape Bantu education. When we crossed the borders, they were always harassing our parents looking for this or that, searching the car, and, and uh, speaking to our parents in very demeaning language, mm, mm. you know? An older person, your mother, they would call a girl, you know, a, a, a man, you know, 60 or so, they would call John, they didn't bother to know their name. Yeah, yeah. So for a very young age, you experienced apartheid. So you, you, you kind of had this consciousness in your mind about what you would do about it when you grow up. Yeah, and uh, you made uh, you meant mention of something very important when you said that uh, you know you never chose politics, but uh, because politics at that time was just a way of life, and uh, you found yourself in exile, and uh, you landed in New York, after which you started you know solidarity movements. Let's talk about how that shaped your political career, and uh, you decided that uh, politics will be your way of life moving forward. Uh, as I say, you know, I was at school at Morris Isaacson yeah. here in Soweto mm. when I was brought into the underground by a, a classmate of mine, Naledi Tsiki. Mm. Yeah, he showed me the Freedom Charter and he asked me to read it and uh, in his presence, all the ten uh, clauses, and he asked me if the things that we were going through, I was prepared to change. And I said, of course I'm prepared to change. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of my entrance into the underground. I must yes. have been 17, maybe 18. And then it was a matter of having a solution to what is happening to you, yes. rather than being a standby watcher, if you see what I mean which is why I decided to name my book On the Stage of Time. Mm. It was mm. a time, it was a platform that a black person could not run away from. Mm -hmm. Not if your consciousness had already been uh, pricked, if I may put it like that. Mm -hmm. You just mm -hmm. couldn't run away from it. And I found out later that my father had been involved in the Youth League of the ANC. I knew my brother was involved because he was the serving president of SASO at the time. Right. So you couldn't escape it, you know, right, right. because the way of escaping was to accept it and say, you know what, we're going to be beggars on our, on our knees forever. Yeah. But the alternative was to not be beggars on your knees, but fighters. But fighters, yeah. And, and that was the choice that was open to you. So our choices were very limited, I must say. And your political career uh, led you to uh, training as a soldier for Umkondo Esizo in Angola. Yes. Let's talk about how it was, um, I mean, how life was in those camps, especially for a young black woman. Uh, you know, what I find interesting is that all of us in 1976, when we left the country, all we wanted to do, to do was to get an AK-47, hmm. learn how to shoot, come back home, shoot the boars, hmm. and, uh, hmm. you know, the revolution would be over, and then we would take over. 
Yeah. But we found out once we were out there that it was not as simple as that. Yeah. And I must say the leadership of the ANC at the time was so solid in its education, mm. in its conscientization of young people. And what I admire about that time was that they didn't have to tell us verbally that the organization has to be renewed, as they are saying now. They accepted new blood, bad as it was, because we were militant, we were insulting, we were in a hurry. But, you know, they groomed us, they were patient with us, they could see our potential. And yeah. they accepted us into the movement, and through our acceptance of different generations, the movement kept on being renewed. Mm. Unfortunately, that doesn't <coughs> happen anymore. In fact, those of us who were there at the time, we are being elbowed out in very many ways. So that institutional memory of renewing the organization, yes, in a new ground, in a new environment, is, is lost. Because if you remember, this is a liberation movement yeah. that was born in 1912. Mm -hmm. So how did it survive all these years? You know, I'm through renewal. I'm quite intrigued you actually uh, mentioning the issue of renewal because that has been the song that the ANC has been singing for the past uh, decade or so. Uh, when you say that um, the ANC had to renew itself by accepting new blood, what do you think needs to be done now for the ANC in terms of its own renewal? And uh, what do you think needs to change here in South Africa just given the current state of affairs? Well, to start with, I think there's a, a wrong mindset. I have wondered why we continue to call ourselves a liberation movement. We're in government. Mm -hmm. We can't be both. Okay. Yes, we were a liberation movement because we wanted to get into government. Yeah. So the first step is recognize that we are in government, we are in power, and then take it from there. Because if you keep on harping about the liberation movement, you are going to think liberation movement. We should be talking about the second phase of the revolution. Which is? Which is economic empowerment of our people. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, access to land as one of the factors of production. What can we do without land? Yeah. I mean, I served in Zambia for four years, having lived there for many years. My friends in Zambia, when they are retrenched, they don't agonize about getting another job. They think of their farm that they have, and they go back to the farm, and they plow, or they milk cows, or whatever it is. It's a fallback position for a black man in Africa, the land. So as long as our land issues are not addressed, yeah. and you know the biggest problem we had during the Codessa negotiations yes. was the powers we gave to the Constitution to guard the economic benefits of those who had them before. Mm -hmm. As if that was not part of the struggle. It's not true that the PAC is the only party that called for, you know, the, 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 the land question. Even the ANC was about the land question. But now it has been put in the back foot. Okay. And how do we progress? Right, right. Ms. Mg, lovely chatting to you. I wish you had more time. But uh, all I know is that this masterpiece is a blueprint, and especially for, you know, the young emerging politicians, the fresh blood, as you referred to them. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Well, that was for my ambassador and author, Ms. Mg, speaking to us about her memoir titled On the Stage of Time.